when I put on my architect's glasses, I see you all as animals, dogs, monkeys, even cockroaches. And this upsets some of my clients. Is that because they believe that they're better than animals? My dog, Kumi, who we're going to talk about today, or we're going to share some of his design instincts, couldn't disagree more. But a clear majority of Americans really believe that they're better than animals, that they are superior. Architecture is a rational pursuit. So how do we incorporate this knowledge we know into our design? Could an investigation of the things that in, instincts that inspire us to make places that protect us, places that shelter us, places that provide us food and pleasure, could that be a, a way to get to a better design of buildings? I want to take you back for a second, though, because I've been a designer all my life. And I remember my first design effort at the age of eight. And it was funny to hear from Meg about uh, using tools. My first thing that I wanted to do was to build a tree house, a magnificent, magnificent tree house. And my father was a safety nut. And he said, no hand saws. So as a reaction, I had to figure out another way to do that. And so I got a piece of plywood. And I got a hammer and I perforated little holes and tried to build a tree house out of sheets of plywood that I bent like paper. It was a colossal failure. <laughs> and so later, as a perhaps an act of teenage rebellion at the age of 18, I decided I was going to become a carpenter. And that was the first year of my 40 years of design and construction. Now, I've spent a lot of time around campfires, and I've spent a lot of time building tree houses. So far, I've built six tree houses. And the things that I learned building tree houses and sitting around campfires were almost as helpful to me in my design career as my attendance at an architecture school. By the time I attended uh, Columbia University, the word in the air was rigor. Rigor, the application of rational thought to every problem. And so we would say we would inevitably, just like our, our idols Le Corbusier and Mies van der Rohe, we would inevitably uh, talk about, say, plumbing, a simple thing. And we talk about the logic of the plumbing stack. Where does it go? Never a discussion about, is it really culturally appropriate for a bathroom to open out into a kitchen? This stuff sort of drove me crazy, because it seemed like, isn't this about living? And then uh, never a discussion also about the character of materials or emotion in architecture or the character of light. Scientists have long puzzled over our relationship as humans to nature. On top of that, they've wondered what architectural experiences did we have in trees in our prehistory? What did we have that drove us to seek certain kinds of architectural spaces that related to nature? My first experience with uh, this was at Morris Arboretum. And these social scientists that I just mentioned have focused on this relationship with science and people. And it's a love of trees and a love of nature that we call biophilia. My first experience with biophilia was with the Morris Arboretum and at the University of Pennsylvania. It's this tree canopy walk that is 500 feet long. It's a series of decks and netting and tree houses and bird's nests. And it's 50 feet above the ground. Kids and parents love it. Here's the netting uh, above. It's kind of scary. And the thing that really got to me was after we had completed this series of tree houses, nests, and everything, the families, the parents and the children, uniformly had an obsession, a focus with the tree houses. And I began to wonder, what is it about tree houses that makes us as a people so excited? Everybody felt good, and it seemed a little odd to me. It seemed like it's just a tree house, right? Haven't we all built them? But everybody remembers what is it like to be in that tree house as a child. I started to look into it, and it turns out there is some science about tree houses. There is science that we have not really thought of, not really paid attention to, because we are a rational set of designers. We don't pay attention to our emotional world, but it does exist out there. And what we found out is that tree houses provide us with a sense of refuge and a memory of refuge. And when we were emerging from the plains of Africa, as a, you know, as really as early human beings. We were hunters and we were fighters and we would look for places that we could hide. And we would look for places that we could climb up into a tree, find a secluded little place 
and uh, look down upon the savanna below us to see either prey so we could shoot them or our enemies so we could shoot them. I guess it's, it's both a, uh, the same result. But uh, it made us feel good and, and we still have this memory. Developmental uh, psychologists think that this is still part of our culture as human beings. And now these kids, they're sitting in part of this treehouse, and they have that same feeling of enclosure. This is actually the bird's nest at, at the Morris Arboretum, hanging out at the end of the structure. They have the same sense of enclosure, with the exception that they're really a little bit nervous. And they're nervous because those big eggs there worry them, because they think a big bird is about to land on those <laughs> eggs. And every time I go there, the kids are sitting dutifully on the eggs, but they're also worrying about what it, what's coming next. So modern architects today haven't really paid a lot of attention to these issues. These are high rises in Shanghai. And they look great. They look like apartment buildings that you've seen a million times. They're vertical living spaces. They don't make you feel good about being in them. They don't make you feel enclosed or speak to your need to see prey on the, on the ground like I'm describing or any of that good stuff. But the world's changing. Look at this apartment building in Paris. We're beginning to acknowledge that there is a power and a presence in the world of nature that we don't really understand but we react to as human beings. This fern bar in the 1920s in Boston really had it figured out. When I look at this, I just feel kind of good about that place. And it's just a little carousel with ferns on the floor. But to me, it makes you feel good about seeing plants. And I'm not an arborist. I'm not a botanist. I don't really have an agenda here. But I really just know that I react really positively to being around nature. And we know from science that people do feel better being around plants. Their heart rate goes down, their sense of well-being will go up. And the funny thing to me is even pictures of plants are exciting to people. So you can paste a photo of a plant up in your office cube and you're gonna feel better. But I'm not really advocating that we just put stuff in pots and look at it and that's the end of the day. It's a little more complicated than that. We know that people love being in buildings that reflect the complexity of nature or mimic nature's complexity. And that's because we were hunters. And when we're hunters going out into a field, we're looking for patterns and we're looking for a disruption of those patterns. A hunter, like in this image, would see a zebra emerge from the brush and he would, of course, want to shoot it once again. This stimulates our brain, it's why we like puzzles, and it's why we like complex patterns. And you see this in architecture. And so you're thinking, well, how are we gonna put plants? Is it, is it only just trees in a, in a building? Is that what you're talking about? No, it's a little more complicated, again, than that. In buildings like Rennes Cathedral in France, the rose window, at which these are very you know, prominent art pieces, they call it a rose window because it's made to look like a rose, it's organic forms, and it makes us happy to be around them. So that's a very romantic vision of it, but we get to Phillips Exeter Library by Luke Kahn. It has the same resonance for us. When you look at the small windows, they become the larger windows, and they relate to the structure of the building. And know it or not, there's something we really like about that. We get the puzzle, we're engaged when we're looking at it. It's not a random set of occurrences. Light. Light is the basis of our lives, and it really it reminds us of where we came from, the sun. And so the play of shadow on the walls is magical to us. And what we know from science is that people, even seeing the play of shadows on a wall throughout the day and not seeing outdoors, are reminded of nature, and it makes them feel good. And so I'm an advocate of treating sunlight as an asset, not just a big blast of light coming into, you, into a room. The way this images are arranged is they have shadow that is created by skylights with bars of wood across it. So I'm an advocate of treating light like that, where we can set it up to, to do a dance for us through the day, or just use Venetian blinds. It gives you the ability to turn the light on and off and manipulate it, and it's exciting for us. We want to be entertained and reminded of nature, but we want to be entertained throughout the day. So light is also treated at an interior level as a problem. 
you know, a, a lighting designer or an engineer. We like to say nasty things about engineers sometimes, we architects, because we feel uh, like aesthetically superior. But, and maybe we are in some instances. Some of the best engineers in the world are great designers. Light is seen as a problem. The way that people treat light, it's typically, let's make it monolithic. Let's have a constant lighting level. But it, it makes for a boring interior, and I purposely picked an image that's super boring. But it also makes for really dull employees. And I wonder, why do we need to make everything constant and even? Why not make the lighting lower and then give everybody in their cube the ability to have their own light? to have their light, turn it on, turn it off. And that way, you're going to have an evolving lightscape in an office. And we're just going to be more interested. We're going to be happier when we're inside these office spaces. Fire, the obvious relative of the sun, is the other thing that we as people, we relate to it at a, a visceral level. This is an image from Burning Man, which is a week-long festival about fire. I'm sure you all know about it. But it just occurred to me, how can you spend a week celebrating fire, it must be something really important in our lives and our culture. When you come around a fireplace, a fire pit, a campfire, it implies lots of things for you about your life and your history as a human being. It may, means the end of the day, it means uh, friends, it means food, it means stopping, it means slowing down, and it also means I can plan for the future. And I imagine people in our prehistory coming to a fire pit or a, it would be a campfire, and just knowing they're safe and that they can plan for the hunt or the harvest and moving forward with that. This fire pit is a project we did in uh, Philadelphia, and it speaks to the resurgence of fire in our lives. There's fire pits everywhere that are in fashion. I hail that as a wonderful thing, and I advocate that we have fire everywhere. We can stand it you know, without burning the house down. So you see it upon entry. You see it at your house, you see it at a restaurant. I've even put them in summer camps where you enter. And people get it. And they don't know why they get it. It just makes them feel good. And our primate relatives, it turns out we have a lot, of, a lot in common with our primates. They have a really highly developed social structure, just like humans do. And it takes a lot to change that. But one way that is deconstructed, and essentially they start to socialize with each other, comfortably is when, say, a chimp will find a bounty of food. And the chimp will let out this hoot and say, it's party time, essentially. And this relates, really reminds me of the way we see ourselves in kitchens. And it's really quite similar. There's chimps up top partying there, and there's people in our kitchen partying as well. And when they do that, when they have that party, the chimps, the amount of touching they do socially is multiplied a hundredfold. And so this food breaks down all the social hierarchies and lets people come together and be intimate and touch. And so as a designer, one of the things I think about is how do we encourage people to touch? Because that's a big frontier in breaking down social boundaries. So I want to design rooms that are small, not big. Like the big kitchen is great, but, but a small kitchen is where you hang out at a party. It's where everybody gravitates to. And there's a reason for it. It's because we want to break bread with someone, make it neutral. When you meet with your boss, you're going to be the same person at the same level as, as you are. You meet with your working mates, you're, the same, you're at the same social level. And then you go back to work the next day, and it's higher and lower. And it's just like we are with chimps. Cockroaches. I've been waiting to show this picture because I think it's kind of icky. We have a lot in common with cockroaches in the way that we use space. Cockroaches hate open space. Being by themselves in a room is like, you just don't, when you walk in a room and there's cockroaches in there, you don't see them milling around in the middle of the space. When they come into your kitchen, they go right for the kick space underneath your kitchen cabinets. And that's because they're not comfortable being out in an exposed place. And they'll run under the cabinets, grab their food, and run back. And this reminds me a lot of the way we humans live in our big public spaces, like at a sports arena, or at a church, or a restaurant, or at a dance hall. We don't want to be that person in the middle. And I think <laughs> that person is dancing with their mom, so they have to be there. But where that guy really wants to be is a wallflower. He wants to be up against the wall, because he is, you know, it's empty. And everybody just, ugh, they just don't want to be out there unless they want to be on display. So 
everybody, all of us, not just wallflowers, want that sense of protection. And I want to design things that encourage that. This image is a restaurant that we did, and it incorporates a lot of the, the ideas that I'm talking to you about. You walk in the door, you see fire, and it just it welcomes you. That space in the back over there is where the people are sitting and it's sunlit, is a small space opening onto a larger space. And that's the way we want to be. We want to be protected. When you walk into a restaurant and there's nobody in there, are you going to take the table right in the middle of the space? Or are you going to hang back a little bit with your back to the wall and make sure everything's safe? Uh, there's also images on there, coincidentally, of ferns. On, on the back, you can't really see them. But the point here is that it makes us feel good to be around greenery. You're going to find a lot of places in your lives that reflect these ideas. And I encourage you to think about it when you leave this uh, event today and look at the spaces you're in and think, well, why do I like this or why do I hate it? One of those spaces, the last image here, is my bedroom, which is my latest treehouse. And I, I looked at it as I was putting this event together, thinking, like, you know what? This is a treehouse. And it does all the things we're talking about. I can see right through the trees to my prey below, three stories down. I can see my enemies, I suppose, uh, three stories down. There's shadow. See the beautiful shadow coming in there because it's filtered through the sunlight. There is a fire source there. And there's a low ceiling that makes me feel like I'm inside that tree. And all of this uh, provides me with uh, safety, shelter, and pleasure. Thank you.